In the early days of the internet, radical libertarians were scattered, lonely, and faceless. Without direction, they resigned to scour the web, sifting through content providers in a wasteland plagued by YouTube demonetization, Facebook jail, and covert internet censorship. But then, in 2017, the Libertarian Union was formed. Finally, the average Joe Libertarian could find a thriving community of independent podcasters and content providers, all in one convenient location. At Libertarian Union, we'll always have the latest news, interviews, discussions, and even movie reviews. With hundreds of episodes and more added all the time, you'll always find something fresh at libertarianunion.com. Hey everybody, before we get started with the show today, make sure if you've never checked out a show notes page for any episode in the past that you check out today's. There is going to be an over 50% discount waiting for you there for what we're talking about today. I don't want to give away who the guest is until we get into it. But rest assured, it's going to be worth your while to check LukeTatum.com slash 28. With that said, let's get into the episode. Welcome, everyone, to episode 28 of the Culture of Peace podcast. My name is Luke Tatum, and this is the show where I interview people who are advancing the message of liberty and changing the culture for the better. I know there are a lot of podcasts out there these days, and more all the time. So as always, thank you for choosing to spend your time listening to this program. That tells me that you, like so many others, are choosing to take responsibility for the present state of our culture, and you're ready to start moving things back in the right direction. Please take a moment to leave a rating and review on iTunes or Stitcher, wherever you listen to the show, and help get the word out to a wider audience. Show notes for today is luketatum.com slash 28, so be sure to check there for links to everything we talk about. Now, today I'm talking to Kevin Flanagan. Kevin holds an undergraduate degree in law and society, and is pending his master's in politics, philosophy, and economics. He also has a passion for ancient societies and cultures, which led him to explore the history of early Ireland. So along this journey, he discovered the ancient Brehan Laws, a legal system indigenous to Ireland, and began to research the features of this system, uh, founding the Brehan Law Academy in 2013, to act as a hub for all things ancient Ireland, but with a particular focus on the often overlooked Brehan Laws. Kevin, welcome to the show. Hey, Luke. Uh, So excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me on. Um, And thanks for the introduction. This is a topic that I really love to speak about, and I love to talk about how it overlaps with liberty. So I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. Perfect. Well, hey, I'm really excited we finally got our schedules to line up and make this happen. The uh, time zone thing is a tricky business. I've done yeah. an episode internationally before, and uh, you know that, that adds a whole new level of complexity. So I appreciate your flexibility, and I'm glad we could do this. You know, of course, I gave you kind of a condensed introduction, and I'm sure everyone is sitting there thinking, okay, what are the Brehan Laws? Uh, You know, normally I want people to kind of tell their story and give me a lot of backlog about, you know, how they got into liberty and stuff. But this is Mm -hmm. such a dense topic. I think we might ought to just jump right in. So if you would just give us a high level picture. What are the Brehan laws? Mm -hmm. Okay. well, you're you're absolutely right. It is a very dense uh, subject and it's even hard to kind of sum up the Brehan laws in in a very simple sentence and simply because they are so different this system was so different to what we're used to today. And so for me, it's it's helpful to kind of compare it to what we have today, where we have a parliament, usually an uh, elected parliament, who legislates law. Um, these people actually make up the law, the, make the statutes and so on. And then these uh, they use the force mechanisms of the state to enforce these laws and, uh, you know, uh, co- I would say coerce people to comply with them uh, in different ways. What's interesting about the Breton laws is there was no codified system of law as we would be used to. In fact, they were more 
um, sets of principles. It was more to do with a, a mindset that they had in relation to society. And a lot of what we have today, we have like actual written texts and documents starting from around 6th and 7th century, which we call the legal texts. Uh, and now these legal texts were actually aimed at the, the lawyers, the judges, the, who we would call Brahans, uh, and they were just simply used to guide them in their determination. So even though we have a lot of material, the material was aimed at people who already knew a lot about this topic, and it was just a, uh, there to guide their memory and so on. And a lot of what we see in these texts is what we could describe as aspirational. So same as our legal systems today, they try to create an order in society that that we are aspiring to in order to create peace and prosperity and so on. Uh, the Brehan Law was similar in that way, that it was more of an aspirational thing. How they worked in practice, we have very little evidence about that, unfortunately. But thankfully, these people, these uh, great ancient scholars, they loved to write things down. They loved to think about like complicated legal issues. So from the fragments of manuscripts that we have remaining after the, the colonial, uh, the colonization of Ireland, we can still piece together a very interesting picture of what that early Irish society looked like. Now, the biggest difference between the Breton law and today's legal system. Today's legal system was more of a is more of a top down legal system, whereas the Breton law system was more of a bottom up system. So how does that work? Well, basically, you just imagine people in a society living together, as they engage in their day to day activities and their business and so on. Uh, certain customs begin to develop about how you do business, how you enter contracts, uh, marriage ceremonies, and so on. These customs develop through practice. And when a custom is practiced for a very long period of time, it becomes a norm. And eventually that norm is what we would call a law. And the interesting thing about the judges at this time was that their role was not in, in creating law. I know that the common law people, the people who uh, common law systems, they say that judges don't create law, but they do in fact uh, through their judgments. The the Brehans, they weren't like making up the law, and neither were the kings. Actually, what they had to do is understand the customs that were in place by the people, and the best judges were the ones who knew those customs very well and knew how to interpret the the principles in relation to the set of facts that come before them. So. In order to be a successful Brehan, it wasn't about having political favor and being appointed by the king or whatever, you know, we have today. In order to be a successful Brehan, you had to be someone who understood the principles of fairness and justice and the customs of the people. One more point I'll say on this before pausing, you can, you can, um, you can guide me in another direction or you can uh, go a bit deeper is that the, 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 uh, the, the judges, they didn't act with um, like today. You have your 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 uh, high court judges and so on. Uh, in the early Irish system, anybody could be a judge in theory because they operated in like to use an economic term. It was like a market opening. It was an open market of judges. There was no like guild of judges or you know group that you had to select from. So all the judges are competing against each other in an open market of fairness and justice. And those ones who were most in accord with the principles of the people were the ones who would become the most successful. That's fascinating stuff. And I think it's something that a lot of people would be maybe naturally resistant to, right? I mean, even talking about, say, the English common law, which is maybe the closest approximation I have just thinking about this. That seems like something that would be very, very scary to the general public. You know, how can we let just the general people kind of form the laws in that way? And, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that's something mm -hmm. you can have a successful conversation with people about? Or is it something that just they're terrified uh -huh. and they want to shut you down? No, absolutely. I think I think you can have a successful conversation. And, and let's just kind of uh, uh, strip it back a little bit here to the bones. Pretty much anywhere you go in the world, no matter the culture, the language, the ethnicity of the people who you will meet, you don't steal, you don't harm, you don't kill. That's customary law. That's that's the essence of customary law. So wherever we go in the world, we have this: you don't you don't steal, 
you don't cause harm. All of the legal systems are kind of an extrapolation from those principles. So when we talk about the ordinary people making law, actually it happens quite a lot. It happens in culture. It happens through cultural norms. Uh, we just don't call it a law uh, today. So in terms of like anybody administering justice, well, the, the problem that we have now in the legal system is you have no right to choose your judge. If you are brought before the court for a civil offense or a criminal offense, whatever, there's a judge on a bench and you don't know this man. You don't know his history. You don't know. Is he a good person? Has he got his own like uh, demons in the closet? We don't know. And we have no choice. So the difference was in, in a more, uh, and it's not just in unique to the Breton law. I should say it's, it's, it's found in pretty much all tribal societies. Uh, Pre-colonial legal systems had this sort of basis where you might choose an elder of the village to settle a dispute, or you might choose like a, a, um, you know, a, a third party who knows both of the people in the, in the case, but is impartial. And you would ask them for their opinion and their guidance to settle the dispute. Another huge difference that should be pointed out between our modern legal system and the legal systems of the past and the Breton law is that our legal system today is an adversarial system. Both the parties are against each other. They're at war with each other. And there is a victor and there is a loser. And sometimes you could say that the, the role of the legal system is to kind of institutionalize vengeance and to use the force of the state to extra, ex, uh, extract vengeance for wrongdoing. Now, the, the attitude in the Breton law was very different. It was about reconciliation. There's a big difference that at the end of the case, you want the, part, the, the parties to shake hands with each other and to go on living their lives within that society, maybe not as friends, but at least not as enemies. And that was a big uh, uh, mindset difference uh, in terms of the law. Right. It's not about crimes to society in general. It's more about reparations and, and making things right. So that's, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. That's a really important thing and something that I try to discuss frequently with people is, you know, why, why are we having this kind of vindictive crusade against certain individuals? You know, these high profile court cases that you'll see on the news mm -hmm. and things. That's, you know, it's almost perverse seeing the whole country or the whole world in some cases get into, well, who's right and who's wrong in mm -hmm. a courtroom. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's just insanity. And, and just to go a little bit deeper on that, like when you talk about the criminal justice system, the victim is not an important part of that, uh, that, that process because like you, you said it yourself, it's a crime against society writ large. Uh, that's how it's handled. And so like sometimes they will introduce victim impact statements to, to you know sway the jury or whatever um but the victim is a secondary party to the suit actually the state is the primary party who assumes your your you know assumes to uh, you know take the compensation on your behalf assumes to take the battle on your behalf as a victim so the idea that the state could uh profit let's say from the wrongdoing caused to another person was completely alien to the early Irish. In fact, it was the responsibility of the victim to pursue justice. It was, you're, you're the injured party, so you had to pursue the justice yourself. It wasn't actually until a little bit later, um, with the advent of Christianity, we had the um, a text called Kain Adavon. Adavon was a bishop in, in early Ireland, and he, at the time, and we can go into this a bit more detail if you want, like women were also warriors. So there was, um, the women were fighting in battle and so on. And this bishop's mother was appalled seeing women fighting in battle. So she, you know, she's an Irish mammy. She, she speaks to her bishop's son and she gets him to make this law, which was also called the law of innocence. And this law was basically if there was, if there was going to be a battle, um, between two factions, if women, children or clergymen were injured in that battle, then the church could claim an extra compensation on behalf of them. That was the beginning of, of having a third party, which we now have as the state. That was the introduction of that into Irish society. But prior to that, it would be bewildering to suggest 
that, you know, the king is the injured party when he clearly isn't, you know? Yeah, wow. Okay, I had no idea. So definitely learning a lot as we're going here. And I've taken your class. I've actually taken your your course on Udemy called Ancient Ireland Culture and Society. Uh, Uh Really, really good class. You get into all kinds of stuff on there. So that sort of leads me to the next question. Um, You've got, gosh, you've got the types of housing that people lived in in there. You've got how the family unit is arranged, how marriage worked women's rights, land ownership. I mean, it's all in there. It's way better than any public history class I ever took in high school. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you bet. You bet. Now, a lot of libertarians I've connected with over the past few years like to focus on family and building communities. Could you get into that aspect of the ancient Irish world a little bit more for me? Like, what Mm -hmm. kind of role did the family play, and what kind of effect did that have on this this legal system. Yeah, um, that's a great question, and it it I would say it's it kind of provides the foundation for understanding the entire early Irish society, including the legal system. I think on that course, I begin with the family to to highlight that point. Um. So how can I phrase it? Like the the. We have this issue in Ireland today of the United Ireland. We have Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. Uh, Northern Ireland, obviously, uh, politically speaking, is part of the United Kingdom. And then you have the Republic of Ireland in the south. And this has been kind of influential on the Irish identity for many, many years. Uh, But what's interesting is when you go back into the ancient history and you start looking at Ireland and what it was really like, you realize there was never what we would call a united Ireland. Ireland as a single country did not really exist in the mind of the people. They were they were Gaels. They were ethnically Irish because of their language and so on. But you have to see it like it was made up, it was comprised of family units. And these family units were kind of like tribes, but that might give it, uh, might be the most accurate way to describe them. We use the word in Irish, uh, tua, or for plural, tuaha. And this can translate to mean a people, a tribe, a country as well. So it was kind of an all-encompassing term. And when you traveled across the land, you would come to the territory of these clans. So you would be in O'Neill County, or in my case, Flanagan County. And within that that land, within that area, uh, and some of these tribes were made up of many, many families, you know, uh, joining together. Um, and they would elect their own chieftain and so on. But while you were there, that was their kingdom. And if you were not part of that tribe, you were kind of like an outsider. Okay. So then bring it into the family. I, I jokingly say this to Irish people when I'm trying to promote Brehan Law to them. I'm trying to get them interested in these topics. If you have an Irish surname, then you're descended from royalty. And they go, wow, I never thought of that. They go, but don't get too excited because everybody was, because that was the attitude to it, that families were sovereign. Families were in charge of them, themselves. And like the, and that was broken down into smaller and smaller units to where you have the nuclear family and you had like the household. That was its own kingdom. And they could, they could, we have this phrase, you know, a man's home is his castle. It was very true in Ireland and even to the point where, you know, people couldn't trespass. The king couldn't trespass even onto that land uh, without using force. Let's just say uh, principally speaking, Uh, they could give sanctuary to somebody who was fleeing the law, maybe as an outcast or something. And basically that was their kingdom. So the family unit was was incredibly important to early Irish society. Now, it was different than they had a different conception of family than what we have today. you had the Gelfinne. Sorry, I should say, first of all, the, the word for family is Finne or Finney. Mm. And you had three branches of your family. You had your Gelfinne, which was your, your close kin, your mother, father, and siblings. Okay, your nuclear family. Then you had the Delafinne, which was called, it was translates to mean the true family. And that goes from all of your uh, grandparents' children. So that's all your uncles, aunties, cousins, you were one family unit. And then you had the Irfina, which was all your great grandparents' descendants in one unit. The most important in terms of the Breton law was the Derefina, the second one, 
This is why they called it the true kin. And another way to kind of look at it, to give it a more modern uh, interpretation, they were kind of like being its own, their own companies or their own corporations, if you want. Um, and everybody within this Derafina was a member of that corporation or that company, that family. And they actually had certain liabilities and certain benefits that came of being in that family. So, for example, the law, this is one thing where I think in terms of libertarianism, um, Brehan Law doesn't like speak to the individual. This is a very interesting point because it, the individual was not the most important thing in the legal system. It was the derafina. Mm-hmm. And you were you were treated as part of this wider unit. Now, this, this has a lot of positive um, outcomes, some outcomes that might not be desirable today. But, for example, if you had a young, young man coming of age and he went out into society, do you think he's going to behave better or worse when he realizes that if he does something wrong, all of his uncles, all of his aunties, his grandparents, father, brothers, everything, they are going to suffer directly for his wrongdoing because they will have to pay compensation for that. So it kind of worked in this weird sort of like social insurance sort of way. Like you were, people were more well behaved because there was like the family name was riding on their shoulder. Um, and like the family would have to pay compensation if that offender couldn't afford to pay it. They were liable in the second degree. On the flip side, if somebody caused wrong to you, your whole family was there to back you up legally speaking and this is why if somebody was murdered the family were considered the legitimate claimants because they had lost a member of their unit they had lost a member of their tribe their company whatever and the, the interesting thing with the breton law is though it was very economically focused so they they looked at the loss of a member uh, loss of life is that it had a financial consequence as well that this person would have um you know worked the land produced uh created wealth for the family and now that they have been killed that wealth has been denied them and that was partly uh, taken into consideration when the compensation was being decided to give to that family so family was incredibly important you could say it was like the the fundamental bedrock of society in ireland even the constitution uh of ireland when ireland became independent from the united kingdom uh, it, 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 it notes that the family is the fundamental building block of society. Um, now, that's changed a lot in modern years because the definition of the family has been changing and the idea of a family, what it means to be a family, has definitely changed from what it was in the ancient past. Um, and then this tied into the laws of, there's, a, there's a, a set of laws called the laws of neighborhood. And these governed like the interactions between these different families living in a certain like territory or so on. And this was often around things like, you know, animals escaping from your uh, pound and like trampling the crops of another neighbor. How was that dealt with? And also things like uh, there's laws about beekeeping. And if you're if I'm a beekeeper and I have bees and those bees fly away and they go to your land and they eat the pollen of your flowers and i make honey from that then i was expected to give you some compensation because it was your pollen that made the honey so family was the bedrock the the building block and then after that it was the neighborhood the wider tour do you think it's fair to characterize this as sort of a insurance as well for the individual because you might have varying degrees of skill within a single family unit and that sort of thing. So it's a way to simultaneously kind of protect the Mm -hmm. weaker members, um, you know, just being provided for by the fact that there's a larger group of people. So it's kind of pooling resources and that's maybe one of the motivations or, or no. No, I I think that's, that's, I mean, yeah, I, I think that is the case, and it's not nothing to do with the Breton law. I think that's very instinctual um, for human beings to be like that. You know, we look after each other. We look after, especially our family, usually and traditionally, we look after our family. Um, but as regards to people who weren't skilled and maybe someone else in the family was more wealthy, yeah, there was definitely an insurance there. It was a safety net. There was many safety nets built into the system, which today we have social welfare. 
um, that sort of redistribution of wealth and so on, acting as quote unquote safety nets. Uh, they didn't have the the state mechanism uh, to do that back then, and so so it was like it fell to the family, which is the traditional way that it should be done, right? And um, and I just wanted to, to backtrack a little bit when I said like the law didn't focus on the individual, and so the Brennan law wasn't very focused on individualism. That was only in in regards to the family. Actually, in terms of like your own enterprise and the individual that you were showing up as in society, you were an individual then, and very much a meritocracy, very much based on you know your level of skill. But also tied into who your grandfather was, your father, were they, were they also prof- uh, doing the same profession? Um, so yeah, your, your st- the status in society was, hu- was hugely important, very well defined. And it came down to wealth, how much wealth you had, visible wealth in terms of cattle and land, your merit as an individual, your flair for your craft, and your bloodline. So your skill and your output in society, your productivity in society was sort of connected to your family. It didn't have to be. But most importantly, you know, you had to get out and do something. You had to get out and make something for yourself. So you got a bit of land that was owned by the family so you could start your cattle. You, you might have got a house built for you by your family. And you get a little bit of wealth starting off. This is our safety net. This is our social welfare, let's say. But then it was up to you to do something with that. It was up to you to make more wealth or squander it. And accordingly, your status would change. If you squandered all your wealth because you were gambling or you just didn't know how to manage your money, you would have a lower status, not just in the eyes of your family because you you know, you know weren't living up to their expectations, but an actual legal status in society would change depending on these factors. Okay, okay. Yeah, that helps clarify my understanding. I hope that helps to everyone in the audience as well. So now I um, normally do the show for like 30, 35 minutes. We're almost up to that time. Do you hmm. need to run or do you mind staying on? I'm good. I'm good to go okay. until the hour, top of the hour. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Um, this is one of the things I really wanted to do when I started the podcast. So like I'm going a little bit in depth on these questions because, you know, I'm excited to do it. So I'm glad I appreciate mm-hmm. you being on. And please and please do like feel free to pick up what I'm saying, because like, you know, when you talk about a topic so many times, you know, sometimes I I, I overlook the gems that are right there. So if there's anything else you want to go deeper on, like, please feel free. I'm an open book on this. Yeah, you bet. OK. Well, I do want to maybe we'll circle back around to family stuff um, here in a second, but. I wanted to be sure to work in talking about the king because, you know, I'll probably title this episode something to do with anarchy or libertarianism in the ancient world. And, you know, famously, Murray Rothbard points to ancient Ireland in For New Liberty as kind of a anarchic, anarcho-capitalist society that worked and repelled invaders and did all this stuff, but, you know, didn't. They have a king? Wasn't there a king mm-hmm. of Ireland? Was Rothbard like missing the mark? That would be uncharacteristic, I would think, but mm-hmm. what's the deal? Okay, so little just a little bit of unpacking on this, first of all, because we need to deal with the concept of the king. Um the concept of the king in early Ireland was not the same as the concept of the king in like continental Europe. That's a big difference. Where we have the monarch, you know, mm-hmm. the the divine right to rule the primogenitor, just because this king has a son, he will automatically be the next king. And that son could be, you know, a psychopath or whatever. It doesn't matter because he has the blood of, the, he's the firstborn son, so he's going to be the king and his rule is final. Um, and the system in Ireland was not like that at all. Uh, actually, kings, um, let's use the word that they used, which was a re. The word re was a king, and the ard re was the high king. And it was kind of like, um, hmm, it was a kind of a pyramidal structure here with the ard re at the top. But in order to maintain your power as chieftain, you required the assent of the people below you who you were representing. You were more of a representative than a ruler. You were elected among all the eligible people in the tribe or in the family. 
actually like you know you start with the family you have this big family unit among all the eligible men uh, and we can talk about why it was men in a, in a little bit uh, they would have an election to choose who's going to represent us to the other to the other families around here and that would be the re the the the, the, the head of the family they called it the cane finna the, the family head um so then you just like expand on that a little bit more. Then you would have like all of these families living in a, a village or a county would elect somebody from all of those people to represent them uh, on a bigger level. So you had these many, many petty kingdoms. When I was mentioning that Ireland was never united, it was actually made up of around a hundred or more petty kingdoms that had its own their own sovereignty. And each petty kingdom would have its own representative, uh, which we would call a king. And um, then you had the provinces. There was uh, historically there used to be five provinces of Ireland. Now there's four, and um, and you would have like the king of a province, uh, and ultimately then the kings of the province would, would owe allegiance to the high king. Now that's the kind of uh, let's say aspirational idea, but in practice, you know, people are people. People are motivated by many different things: greed, power, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And a lot of the times, the person who had the title of Ard Ri was often in opposition. There was other people who were claiming that right. There was other people who didn't. Like, they, they seldom had the whole of the island. I would say never had the whole of the island supporting their one, this one person. But for the majority of the people, the ordinary people, the common man, who we never really hear about in history books, th that didn't come into their life. It wasn't, it wasn't part of their world, you know? This was like the aristocratic area of, of, of society where all of these like machinations were going on. Now, to go back even further, when we think about the king in Ireland, the Re, originally their role was more that of a priest. It was more of a ceremonial role. And in a sense, you gave up a lot of your freedom to hold that role because you had the expectations of the tribe, of the people, to perform a certain way, to perform the ceremonies that were needed to be performed to promulgate the laws and by promulgate I mean like just they used to just read them out not actually create them and this was interesting and this is why the king had to be a man the 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 king like I say he was like the he was a, a symbolic figure and in the inauguration ceremony of a king he was married to the land so the land in Ireland is always a woman it's always a goddess even the word era is is from Eru, one of our ancient goddesses. There was other names like Banva, Skota. All of the rivers are named after goddesses. The, the land was seen as the personification of the goddess. Mm. And so this is why the king had to be a man. Okay, it was like the same way the Immaculate Conception has to be a woman, right? Because it's 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 birth. So it was the same idea, and it wasn't done in a sexist way or anything like that. It was more because of their religious beliefs, their ceremonial beliefs. It had to be a man. And he would, uh, in a sense, be married to the land in a ceremony. And then, like, the he, a good king would, they believed, that had an influence on the crops. You know, that a, a, a king who ruled justly would produce bountiful crops and, like, the, the land would be full of food and this sort of thing. So it was very, in the early times, the role of a king was more that of a ceremonial position that was related to their spiritual beliefs and so on. And that's kind of the archetype. But then we have to move into reality. And like I said, we're human beings, right? We're, there's not one of us that is like really king, you know? We're just like these very, very smart primates. And we're still motivated by a lot of those um, sort of like uh, evolutionary impulses towards power and greed and so on. And this caused a lot of, uh, a lot of problems, uh, like in all societies, you know? So, okay, they had a king, but what could the king do? His the, the king in early Ireland, as I understand it, had no more rights than anybody else. Like they couldn't seize your land, they couldn't levy your taxes, they couldn't they couldn't do anything against your will. They required your will, your consent to rule, to to yeah to lead the tribe. Uh, and if they were being like barbarous and tyrannical, well, guess what happens? The people pull their support away from them. They give the support to another king and they needed that support because they were the fighting men they were their their armies you know who would who would defend them and if they didn't have the defense then 
well, then they're sitting ducks, right? right? So they needed to keep people happy. And so it's not to say that the king didn't raise money from the people or didn't get tributes and all of this sort of stuff, but it was done voluntarily and it was done in a kind of, um, it was a very established system where the lower petty king would give some tribute to a higher king and in a, in a, in return he would give them gifts and that could be land it could be you know recognition it could be it could be jewels and stuff like that so it was kind of a mutual exchange where you acknowledge that this person has more you know power than you and by power i mean wealth i mean the ability to do things in society to change things in society but you have an allegiance with them and this was so that's the level of kings but you also when you bring it down to the level of the common man it worked the exact same way and this is why I, this is what i meant when i said status was so important and your status was defined quite clearly by the wealth you had your heritage and your skill because if i was a a farmer who had no land i was called a a dare kayla right a kayla and there was two types of kaylas there was a dare kayla and a ser kayla that means a bonded or a free farmer and basically if i'm if i'm of that status and i want to start like building my wealth i need some land and i need some cattle so i'm going to go to the wealthier guy down the road the boara who is the, the boara meant the cow chieftain he had a lot of wealth because he had a lot of cows and he had land and i would say to him hey can i have some of these cows and can i use some of your land and he say yes but you must give me like two calves every year from what your you know your cows produce or you must give me this much cheese and this much milk and so on so it's not a million miles away from actually how society operates today you know and you want to start a business you go find an investor right but to guess what whether you like it or not you're indebted to that investor you're you're bonded to them it's not to say you're a slave you can voluntarily entered into it it was the same relationship with the kings it was a voluntary or let's just say as voluntary as it could be when necessity, you know, necessity uh, drives people as well. So it was as voluntary as it could be. And that's why it was very different from the type of monarchical royal system that we think of when we think of kings. Okay. And so you touched on a lot of uh, kind of gender issues, you know, about the ceremonial marrying of the king to the <laughs> land and some of that. So I do want to touch on that just maybe briefly but you know international women's day was just a few days ago when we're recording this and i'd like to learn a little bit more about the role of women because i think at least some listeners are going to hear that and so uh, and say man this sounds like a horrifying patriarchal top down system that oppressed women i think that's how we uh -huh. phrase it today so uh -huh. Was, mm -hmm. Is that true or no? This is one of the areas that I, I get asked about the most uh, in terms of Breton law. And it's one of the areas I like talking about the most because I think it's very revealing um, in terms of what's going on in our society today. And there's a lot of misinformation about this in Breton law. It's, it's not a topic that people know a lot about. But when you do speak about it, they might go, oh, that's just, that's where women had equal rights and that's where women were like, so, you know, uh, rulers and so on. And there's an element of truth to that, but it's, it's not, it's not the full, the full picture. First of all, we have to like account for the fact that we were living in the best time in history ever. We are living in the absolute best time of, of all history. And so therefore it's easy for us to forget the struggle and the hardship that our ancestors have gone through for thousands and thousands of years trying to just eke out a survival out of the soil and their bare hands. It was hard. It was so hard. And so a lot of the way the order of society came about was to deal with that hardship. This is why I believe traditional marital roles came about, that the man went out to, to work the land and the woman looked after the child. It wasn't about oppressing women. It was like, this is the only way our children are going to grow up, okay? It was like, it was hard to go out and work in the land as well. Like, uh, you know, from, from dawn till dusk, just trying to survive. It was hard for the men and it was hard for the women, okay? I just want to preface saying that. So when you go into the Brehan Law then and you look at how was the society ordered, as I said, status was very, very important. And 
I also mentioned that we, we seldom hear about the common man when we read history. We read about the rulers, the conquerors, and so on. We don't learn about the fisherman who lived down in Cork and what was his life like, you know, or his wife and so on. And so I admit that some of um, some of this is kind of speculation about how these ordinary people might have lived. Um, but as a default position, a woman's status in early Ireland was based on that of her closest male relatives. Okay, so we are getting into kind of a patriarchy thing here, right? What does that mean? It means that if you're a daughter and you're unmarried, that you are, your status is related to your father's status. And if you cause a wrongdoing in society, which happened, obviously, it was your father who was liable. Okay? Then if you got married, it became your husband. And then if you had, if your husband died and you had no father, it became your, your sons, your, your adult sons. Why is this? Is this because they wanted to suppress women and keep them in their place? No, it was because they wanted to protect women and provide them with the security, uh, financial security, social security, physical security that they needed in order to survive and be, be, you know, peaceful, not killed or whatever, starved. So, so, so that's important to keep in mind that, okay, we, some of these practices may not be compatible, probably aren't compatible in today's society, but they didn't arise out of a will to suppress women. I already mentioned how the land was a goddess. The female, the sacred feminine is rife in all of Irish mythology. It's, it's, you can't divorce from it. The, the, the woman is sacred. The woman was respected. The woman was honored. Now, could a woman become a judge or a poet or a doctor or a warrior? Yes, in every case. A woman could do any job that a man could do apart from being the king, as I said. But there was even a few cases of we, we have of uh, women who were so powerful that they managed to claim the right of the high king for themselves. Um, but there was nothing that stopped women from pursuing the professional careers that the men were pursuing. But guess what? They were judged on the same merits as the men. They weren't judged on a special merit because they happened to be a woman. No, they were judged on the same merits as the men. And that's true equality. And so you, they would go to study. They would take up a profession. And we know like that, that majority of women weren't doing this. It was majority men. But there was no preclusion from women for doing that. It wasn't like they were being repressed. And here's the most interesting thing about this. They operated on the status of their closest male relative until their status was higher on their own merit. So if you had a, a woman who, you know, she was born into, you know, a farming family, let's say. Her father was a wealthy uh, farmer. But she was like, she had a passion for poetry. And she went and she studied the, the, under the great poets and she became a poetess or a druidess or a brehan, whatever she wanted to do. And if her status exceeded that of her father, now she works on her own status in society. So there was nothing to stop women from raising themselves up to a higher position, from following the career that they wanted, from having power. And there's, a, there's many, well, there's a, there's a handful of cases throughout the mythology of, of very powerful women that we hear of, whether it's the mythological queen Maeve, or, you know, to bring it to a more modern era, you had... Um, uh, Grace O'Malley, Grace O'Malley, the pirate queen, they called her. Uh, these, she was the leader of her clan, even though she could never really rightfully be the chieftain, she was still the leader of her clan. Now, the problem, I would like there to be more cases of women, uh, being held up as great heroic figures and great, you know, ach achievers in Irish mythology and Irish history. But then we have to bring in another element here. We have to bring in the Roman church. The Roman Church, Roman Catholic Church, which was not a Gaelic institution. We had a Gaelic Christianity before they arrived, which was very different, very nature-based. Women could also have the high position of a priest in, in the Gaelic Church. But the Roman Church was brought, and we're just past St. Patrick's Day uh, the other day, what by St. Patrick, Palladius, his name was, who was working for the Roman Church. And he brought a new system in place with that. He brought a new set of law. And... Gradually from that point onwards, even though prior to that point we didn't have as much writing 
but we do have the mythological accounts that were passed on orally. But pr after the, the coming of the Catholic Church to Ireland, the status of women gradually, gradually diminishes and diminishes to the point where in the modern era, we had the Magdalene laundries, we had the mother and baby homes, we had mother, women who had children out of wedlock being put into the equivalent of an orphanage or a prison to do laundry by the church. We had the church taking their children and selling them actually to people in America in, a, in a, it's this like illegal adoption, just scandals that came with the, with the church in the last like century. And it was all kind of like a decline. Well, it's not to say that everything the church brought was bad. We wouldn't be talking about the Brehan laws if it wasn't for uh, the coming of Christianity because they also brought the love of the, of the written word and the manuscripts and the great monasteries. And, uh, you know, they, they brought like a peaceful mindset to a people who were killing each other for so long and tribal warfare. There's a lot of good things that came out of it. But in the terms of the status of women, there's a clear decline um, that you can see after the coming of the Catholic Church. Okay, and you, again, are segueing perfectly into the next thing I want to ask you. So, I want, you know, this is culture of peace, right? I always like to talk about peace and the war peace question whenever we can. And so, you're hinting at there's a lot of internal conflict in Ireland. And, you know, so what does that mean for the average person? Are we talking mm -hmm. about constant war? I mean, I know in the modern era, we have bombs dropping all the time. Clearly, they weren't bombs at that time, but... Uh, you know, what is what kind of stability did mm -hmm. the culture have? And were people all just ready to go to war at the drop of a hat? Or, you know, did the yeah. fact that there wasn't a central state help or hinder mm -hmm. this peaceful, you know, world? I mean, kind of yeah, it, on that. It's a great question. And there's like, just as you're asking, there's many things popping into my head, many different angles. Uh, uh, that we can we can go with this but um i think a good place to start is this idea of the united ireland you, you mentioned the bombs like i i just i'm not very old but i'm old enough to remember when the troubles were still kind of happening in northern ireland and and i know that it's it's a powder keg and like the brexit stuff that's going on now like it's a very sensitive issue that this could arise again but let's go further back the united ireland there was never a united ireland there was factions and they all were rivals or, or allies uh, for power, you know, and this is no different today than any other time. Um, interestingly, though, we have the, the, the great king, Brian Baru. Anybody whose surname is O'Brien is a descendant of this king, Brian Baru. And he was the guy who united, they say, united the clans of Ireland to fight against the Vikings who had made themselves very comfortable in Ireland of this point. They've been there for many hundred years, and they had an, a stronghold in Dublin, very powerful people. And the Irish, the reason why the kind of Vikings got such a stronghold in Ireland is because they, the Irish people were more concerned with their own feuds. And they didn't really care because they were trading with the Vikings. It was like, you know... Uh, but he, you know, they say he united the clans to fight against the Vikings. But when you do a little bit deeper research into that, you realize that, in fact, he had Vikings fighting on his side and he had Gaelic clans that were fighting with the Vikings against Brian Baru. People like the, uh, like who are allegiance to the O'Neills in the north who didn't accept Brian Baru as high king because the O'Neills had been high king for dynasty before him and he interrupted their dynasty so even within like this black and white view of history where you say oh he beat the vikings it's like no inside that there was all sorts of allegiances and so on going on in fact brian baru was married to the mother of um the the viking king whose name i can't uh, remember right now so there's all this sort of intrigue and and you know <laughs> the same sort of stuff that goes on you know like it's uh, political backstabbing allegiances everything like that so was Ireland a peaceful society? I would have to say, like, compared to today, no. Um, but, like, was it dangerous for you if you were just, like, a farmer or something? Maybe, <laughs> you know, because, like, these other people would like, come and take your, your cattle or your land. Cattle raiding was a big part of the culture where you would, like, get your friends and your family together and you'd go and raid the cattle of someone else. Um so, so when we talk about the Breton law, it's easy to look at them with, with rose-colored glasses. And that's what the Republican leaders did 
in like a hundred years ago when they were trying to raise this um you know gaelic consciousness among the irish people who at that stage had been pretty much like subdued by the english and a lot of people were not even in favor of a irish republic or it wasn't even a republic at the time it was just a, a free state they, they weren't in favor of it and they tried to like raise this um gaelic consciousness in the people so that they would get behind the idea of a free uh, free ireland and then um, so it was a lot of this rose colored glasses stuff came then when they were talking about the Brennan laws as this great golden age of ireland when we were like you know the the the, uh, the best culture in the world and like uh, an amazing place full of music and dance and fairies and it's like yeah but also there was a lot of blood you know um uh, traditionally speaking the gales were a warrior class you know the gales same with the, the the Scots, the Saxons. They were all warriors, you know. It's not even that long ago, and that's why I'm saying again, this is the best time in the world to be alive. Your likelihood of dying in battle today is like almost nil, uh, whereas back then it was a, it was a pretty common occurrence, not just in Ireland but 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 everywhere, you know. And then that brings us to the Christianity again, because what Christianity brought to Ireland, and I I can already hear a lot of people are going to listen to this, like Irish people, they're going to be so annoyed that I speak uh, highly about Christianity in this way because a lot of people see just the destruction that Christianity did. And then on the other side, you have people, when you speak about the Druids or you speak about the destruction Christianity did, they get very offended because they're Christians, you know? So it's, it's, it, that's an interesting sort of um, dichotomy that, that goes on there. But it can't be denied that the Christianization of Ireland brought peace, made the people a lot more peaceful. Because we had the idea of, you know, the consequence, the heaven and hell and the, you know, uh, killing is a sin. And it's not to say that people just stopped overnight, but gradually Ireland, which was a warrior society. Um, I kind of liken it a little bit to the, uh, the Shogun and the Samurai, you know, this warrior code and the warrior families that you find in, in the Samurai is, wouldn't be a million miles away from what's happening in Ireland. But at some point in the history, we became the island of saints and scholars. And the island of is. saints and scholars. And that was the peace, you know? That was the, 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 the peace. Yeah, and that's a name that I, I just love. It's a very, of course, it's a romantic uh, yeah. title to give to it, but um, really, really awesome. And I think it sums up the kind of nature of the Irish culture very well. So... Uh, I'm I'm really a fan of bringing that up in conversation whenever I'm having these chats mm-hmm. with others about Ireland and you know would libertarianism mm-hmm. work and all that. It's it's a good example and a good way to start the conversation. So, but man, that's like a whole other episode. We could get into the warrior code and we could get into all that stuff. That would be a lot of fun. Uh, but I know you've probably got to go. Um, I'm going to have to get out of here myself fairly soon. So we'll just, we'll wrap it there. Um, any final word? And then, you know, how can people mm-hmm. keep up with you? How can we um, send people to your courses that you've done? Just tell us all that. Yeah. So the final word, I think on this, because, um, there's a lot of information has come up on this and probably people are thinking uh, lots of different things, maybe lots of different questions. But the main message that I, I would like people to take away from this is the, the society that we have today that we take for granted because we were just born into it, the way things are done, we don't believe it can happen any other way. Well, in ancient Ireland, and not just Ireland, but in like Aboriginal culture, Native American culture, and so on, we find an example of a different way things can be done. We find an example of of how justice can be done, how reconciliation can be done, how peace can be done without a state. And that, to me, is why I'm so fascinated in this topic. It, It puts the responsibility on the shoulders of the individuals themselves to create the society that they want. And when we become so mature and so, like, yeah, I would say civilized, for want of a better word, to, where, to the point where the state becomes redundant because we don't r- rely on it to settle our disputes. We don't rely on it to to enact vengeance on our behalf because we find a way to go and put the hand out and find reconciliation. So that's the, the last point I'll say on, on the Breton Laws. If people want to 
find out more about this, like the Facebook page is probably the most active Breton Law Academy. I do have a blog as well, brettonlawacademy.ie. Um, there's a lot of articles there and there's a lot of free resources. If you go to the free resources section, you can also get access to my courses that way. Uh, currently, I have Irish mythology course. That's about three hours long on Udemy. And I have, as you mentioned, Ancient Ireland Culture and Society course, which is about four hours long. And I am almost finished producing a Breton Law course, which is going to focus more specifically on the laws themselves, uh, as we've spoken about in this program a little bit. Uh, and that's probably the best way to get in contact with me. If anybody wants to send me an email, brettonlawacademy at gmail.com. And I'm always happy to talk about these topics, so don't be shy. Okay, perfect. Well, Kevin, I absolutely love what you're doing. Of course, um, it's fascinating stuff. I never would have heard of it if not for your initial course, the um, Culture and Society course. And so now, you know, that allows me to kind of proselytize and, and spread the word a little bit about that. Um, so it's a great resource. I highly recommend everybody checks that out. I appreciate you answering some of these questions, kind of helping me have a better understanding, and I hope the audience appreciates that as well. Thanks again. Thank you so much, and we'll have to do this again sometime, if you don't mind. Uh, I would love to, Luke. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me on. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. That wraps up another episode. This again, episode 28, so luketatum.com slash 28 for the show notes. Like I mentioned before we started recording, there is a promo code for you to use, and that is going to be good on Kevin's new course called The Brehan Laws that actually came out just after we recorded this episode. It just took me a few days to get the editing done, and so the normal price on this new course is $60. The promo code is for almost 60% off, so it's $25.99. And it's an entire delve into specifically the Brehan Laws. Super fascinating. I think there's a lot we can learn from that. So be sure to check it out. I also have a short link for you. It's just going to be luketatum.com slash Ireland if you just want to go straight to the course. But be sure to take my link so you get a discount. And just so you know, it's not a affiliate link. I'm not getting anything from this other than just recommending it to you and the, um, the psychic benefit that I have from knowing that I'm helping to spread the word about ancient Ireland. So you're not helping support the show in any way by doing that other than just letting Kevin know who sent you. So thank you all so much. Appreciate your patience while I was getting this episode done. And I'll catch you next time.